So thank you very much uh, for your participation in this special conference opening the new season, the new edition of the SAYO webinars um, for 2021. And thank you very much to all the um, to all the people for your support to our activities and the association. Okay, today is a real pleasure for me, of course, to introduce uh, our speaker, Professor Geoffrey Hewins. Geoff, thank you very much on behalf of all the members of the SAIO for your kind willingness to participate in this activity and to share with us your thoughts and ideas about the role of input-output analysis in these uh, challenging times. Uh, introducing Professor Higgins, uh, for me, is increasingly difficult for me and for many of us because to his impressive, extensive, intense and brilliant academic career, uh, we have to add our personal experience, uh, his exceptional personality, his enthusiasm, his scientific generosity, um, and his positive attitude uh, that almost all of us have enjoyed. So uh, perhaps it's easier to present him as, wow, we have here Professor Hewins. <laughs> but uh, today we are here more than 70 people, and perhaps someone has never heard about Professor Hewins. So let me just a few words to remember that Professor Hewins is Emeritus uh, Director of the Regional Economics and Application Laboratory, Emeritus Professor of the Department of Geography and Regional Science, Economics, Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Illinois. He has served as President of the International Input-Output Association, the International Regional Science Association, he has been awarded Doctor Honoris Causa by the University of, Bor of Borgogne in France and by the University of Extremadura here in Spain. Uh, he has published more than 200 articles, chapters on a wide range of topics. He is fellow of many different associations, including our Sociedad Hispanoamericana of an the Analysis Input Output. And in fact, I would say that he was one of the first to conceive and to promote the idea of ASAIO. He's a world expert in urban and regional economic analysis, regional econometric input output models, structural change, input output, social accounting matrix, general equilibrium models. And he's a convinced promoter of the careers of the young researchers and a friendly advisor of many of us. And moreover, Professor Higgins is also a fan of the Spanish Premier League. I think so. <laughs> okay, and today Professor Higgins uh, is here to share with us um, his thoughts on the role of the input-output analysis and global value change today, the main challenge for our disciplines and the most promising avenues for input-output researchers. Professor Hewin, thank you very much again for your kind willingness to be today, and the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Rosa, for your very nice introduction, and congratulations to you and to the other new offices in CHIO for uh, taking on this responsibility. Uh, I have, uh, over the last year, uh, attended many, many of the presentations, and uh, I think it is very, very good that you are continuing this effort because I think we all need to be stimulated by gathering, even if it is only electronically. Um, what I, I'd like to, to do is uh, move very quickly um, through my presentation. Uh, I, I start off with the following uh, perspective. Uh, when I attended the uh, 2013 Input Output Conference in um, Kitakushu in Japan, uh, Richard Baldwin uh, came there and referred to IO analysts as the new rock stars. And in my career, I think that was the first time I had ever heard somebody talk so positively about input output analysis. And it was sort of very encouraging uh, to feel that at least uh, a subset of the economics profession uh, was recognizing that perhaps IO analysis had something to contribute to understanding 
the structure and trajectory of, of modern economies. And I think that this uh, sort of feeling uh, generated sort of a buzz, and I think people came out of the, the presentation with big smiles on their faces. And I think that uh, what it reflects is something that is going to be the theme of, of my, my presentation. And uh, it's, it sort of says, that was wonderful, but how do we maintain it? And as rock stars will tell you that they're only as famous as their last recording and um, our memories fade very quickly and the competition for the intellectual space is incredibly in intense and very, very competitive. So while global value chain analysis that was made possible by uh, the brilliant conception that was centered in, in Groningen of the Wired um, uh, project and the associated databases, it provided a boost to the status of IO analysis. And I think it's helped counter a lot of negative impressions of IO as being a marginal outdated enterprise that has been surpassed by computable general equilibrium models and other types of modeling. So I, my main goal is to ask the question, how can IO analysts continue to rock? Uh, how can we maintain, build upon, and expand this newfound credibility? And basically what I'm uh, proposing is a way to more effectively integrate IO analysis into some of the current economic challenges. And most critically, and I think this is really important, is to make it attractive for younger scholars to retain their labels as macro, micro, labor, or trade economists while embracing the use and application of IO analysis. And as Faye Duchin and I recently had a very interesting exchange about the fact that IO analysis is still seen as marginal in economics. And I know a lot of students that are very interested to work uh, on projects that are related to it are very mindful of the fact that if they sort of claim that this is their major specialty, they're going to have a great deal of difficulty uh, securing a job. So this presentation is going to offer uh, some perspectives and suggestions, and it is primarily focused to younger scholars. But as I'm probably the oldest person in this whole group, that includes all of you. Um, but in particular, I'm thinking of uh, people whose careers are just starting. And what I, I, I've listed here are some opportunities where I think um, we can be creative and to move our GVC work to connect with some of these challenges. And the first one on which I'm gonna spend um, a lot of time is the Rebuilding Macroeconomic Theory Project. And I'll say more about each of these things as I come to them. So that's the first. The second one is to link much more effectively with the new economic geography associated initially with the work of uh, Krugman, uh, Masahisa Fujita, and, and Tony Venables, and the less well-known uh, fragmentation literatures, which are very closely linked in terms of their philosophy with the new economic geography. To also think about linking with notions of risk and resilience, and the experience of the last year should remind us that there are challenges that are outside the economic domain that we need to embrace in thinking about uh, our own economies and their trajectories. Uh, the fourth area is, is trying to link uh, some of this work with regional development challenges and regional development policy. In particular, uh, the increasingly dominant uh, modus operandi at the moment called smart specialization strategy. And two final things. Um, we have trade in value added, but what about trade in human capital? In other words, we focus on the movement of goods and services. Can we integrate this with movements of human capital uh, across regions? And how are those two things linked? And what is the sort of degree of complementarity and reinforcement in that regard? And the final issue, is linking this with notions of income distribution and agent heterogeneity. Because right now, uh, 
concerns are very dominant in a lot of the literature about the impacts of uh, income, increasing income inequality across countries and across regions. So the first uh, point I would like to make is this a huge amount of asymmetric information currently in our field. Uh, those of us who work in the regional level are probably very well aware of what is going on um, uh, to uh, um, the uh, uh, new challenges that are taking place at the macro level. The macroeconomists, for the most part, have very little idea of the work that goes on uh, at the regional level. Um, a few years ago, in 2018, in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy, Vines and Wills assembled about 16 or 17 articles. And these articles were focused on something called the Rebuilding Macroeconomic Theory Project. And this was a response to the failure of macro models to forecast and explain the Great Recession of 2008 to 2012. And they identified four major challenges and the papers sort of focused either on all of these things or on specific aspects. The first was financial frictions, the difference between interest rates charged in different parts of markets, for example. Um, to place a limit on the operation of rational expectations, uh, the extension of uh, homo economicus and some of the challenges that this limitation had imposed on the ability of agents to respond uh, to uncertainties in the market. To include heterogeneous agents, and we'll say more about that a little bit later, and to devise more appropriate micro foundations for a lot of the work that goes in to these macroeconomic models. Now, um, uh, uh, let's see, this is not moving. Okay, so what is missing from this list? The first issue is addressing spatial heterogeneity. The spatial micro foundations of the macro economy were not even discussed. Krugman was one of the authors of the articles in this collection, but didn't even, even mention it. Macro analysis operates as if the world is flat and undifferentiated, except between countries. But inside countries, very little attention is paid to that. And I just want to present two examples to show how the spatial distribution is uneven. And the first is coronavirus infections. As of a year ago uh, in the US, you look at this map, it is decidedly heterogeneous. It is lumpy, it is spiky. Uh, and this is not unusual. If we just look at things like unemployment, enormous variations. Uh, uh, from s under 8% to over 16% across the states in the U.S. Um, in the month immediately after the infection started uh, to increase. So the responses across space are very heterogeneous. But the problem is that regional economists, regional scientists uh, have not made a strong case that if we're going to address macroeconomic spatial heterogeneity, we've got to show that the differences in impacts and forecasts in a macro model that ignores that heterogeneity are different than one that provides some sort of macro aggregation of multi-regional models. And I think we have sort of stopped doing this or we never moved in this direction because we felt, well, if we show that there are spillovers or spill-ins from development, from growth or decline in one region or other regions, we've done our job. But the problem is we haven't. And so the question is, how should these effects be modeled and incorporated into multi-regional macro models? And I'm going to use the examples of some work we have done in regional business cycles and show how we can very effectively uh, link this with global chain analysis. And there's limited uh, empirical evidence, but the evidence is pretty overwhelmingly suggesting that there are significant differences in the behavior of the business cycle uh, at the regional level. And one of the uh, uh, important issues is that it very much depends uh, upon the frequency of the data. And as you look through the IO literature, this is something we've really not spent a lot of time thinking about. 
Uh, in IO analysis, the, uh, the work of Andre Avellino that appeared in ESR in 2017, and some work by uh, Donahue and colleagues uh, the same year, has uh, looked at uh, this in terms of temporal disaggregation, and in the case of Donahue, uh, a continuous time model. And to be able to show how uh, these sort of e economic impacts are really varying, particularly when we move from the annual formulation to something of a finer granularity. The work on the business cycles, we looked at um, uh, some examples on uh, some Midwestern states, which are each other's largest trading partner. And if, if these were a country, uh, they would be the seventh largest uh, trading area in the world. And these are regions that have similarities in factor endowments, low transportation costs between them, and the size of the home market is, is uh, very large. Given these strong similarities in structure, one would expect that the share, uh, based on the share of GSP by sector, the business cycles would move together. And we, we uh, developed some dynamic uh, models uh, to forecast this. And one thing we saw very clearly was that there were uh, lags between what happened at the national level and what happened at the state level. And what happened in one state did not uh, necessarily match uh, with other states. So Illinois and Indiana, uh, the two largest of those trading partners, were three to four months apart in terms of entering a cycle and, and recovering from the cycle. And the similarities were true uh, for the other states, but the, um, uh, the variation in, in uh, Indiana was the most dramatic, although the lags uh, were much higher for Michigan and, and for Ohio. And so as we worked through the analysis, what we basically found out that there was a national common shop, the national business cycle, uh, affected each of the sectors somewhat differently. The interconnections between those sectors that we would elucidate using uh, IO analysis uh, was only partially satisfactorily. And what we basically discovered, it was not only the in industry combination in each state, but the production sequence. And what uh, one of Rosa Duarte's uh, recent PhD students, Lucia Bolea, and Marcin, as Rilsini, are referred to as position and participation in the value chain. And we see that as providing a very, very important explanation for why we have these differences in state business cycles. And I can explain that uh, with something that the business um, folks refer to as the bullwhip effect. If you crack a whip, um, the variation very close to the handle is much smaller than the variation of magnitude of the waves as you move farther away. And so what we find is that states that are producing very close to final goods and services are usually less volatile in terms of their response to business cycles than ones that are very, very further back in the value chain. Well, the geo would refer to as the position in the, in the global value thing. So as you move further away, the volatility uh, would be much, much higher. And this process has been exacerbated by production fragmentation that has extended the value chain. So those Midwestern states I talk about, almost all the trade is intra-industry rather than inter-industry trade. So they're part of some sort of continuous production process. But the impacts on business cycles are very, very different. And we looked at this uh, in another way using a, a, a multi-level uh, dynamic model in which we took out the common factor and then looked at the region-specific factors somewhat separately. And what we discovered is some sort of interesting variations across these states. So there are three colors on each one of these charts, the light blue, indicates the national effect, uh, the purple color are the spillover effects from neighbors, and the sort of red, orange, burnt color are the variance from its own uh, activities within inside the state. And you can see just looking at these that the composition is very different across those states with places like Minnesota and Ohio having much more dependence on fluctuations inside their state 
And the horizontal axis, you can think of as time periods from the time of initial shock. And obviously after about four or five time periods, the national effect uh, begins to dominate. So what, what we're explaining here is that it's that position and participation in the value chain is varying. And as a result of that, we're getting these differences in business cycles. So as we're constructing national macroeconomic models, we need to be aware of this important spatial and temporal heterogeneity. And that, I think, uh, if it was embedded in that, uh, would really help uh, improve the quality and the efficiency of a lot of macroeconomic forecasting. The second uh, most important finding from this work was that what we found is asymmetric interactions between states. And so um, the summary chart here is looking at the interactions between Illinois and those uh, surrounding states, including uh, when we added this, uh, the state of Minnesota. And the thicker the arrow, uh, the bigger the effect. So the regional common factor is still the dominating factor. And an empty arrow indicates a negative impact and a fillet arrow indicates a positive impact. So you can see Illinois and Minnesota has a negative relationship. In other words, Illinois negatively influences Minnesota, but Minnesota positively influences Illinois. Wisconsin and Illinois, it's positive in both directions. Michigan, it's negative in both directions. So what we're uh, looking at here is the possibility that, yeah, we're, we're part of these value chains, but we have negative relationships in terms of growth processes, development processes that are taking place as a result of this. And so I think here is an incredibly interesting opportunity for us to embed this global value chain modeling inside uh, analysis of uh, economic cycles and fluctuations. And I think what we would then do is further demonstrate the value of this incredible database that we still have only partially exploited. And sort of finally, uh, part of this, um, uh, we looked at this at the metropolitan level. In other words, another uh, spatial step down. And we looked at a Markov uh, regime switching model to try to enable analysis and forecast of the degree to which uh, a metropolitan area was going to retain or remain in expansion or move to contraction. And uh, this is the sort of analysis we can, we can uh, develop uh, from this. And what we're trying to understand is, is the magnitude of the phases of these cycles. How much of those uh, does the pos position of participation in the global value chain affect the length? And that's something we haven't done. But what we could summarize this is a sort of ranking of cities and uh, the US um, when it's in expansion has the highest probability of remaining that way. And then the cities are ranked in terms of their, their follow on. And what was so interesting, uh, those of us in the Midwest always expect Chicago to be at the bottom. And uh, uh, we were uh, sort of pleased to see we weren't, but we were very close uh, with Houston at the bottom and Houston mainly because of the nature of its economic structure, very closely tied to the oil and gas industry and very, very sensitive uh, to those, uh, uh, those fluctuations. So the question then is, how much of these changes can be explained by position and participation in those global value chains? And can we identify different spatial and space-time dependencies for pairs of regions or sets of regions? And um, what we were able to do is to use this analysis to show how during the last uh, recession, there were enormous spillover effects from one region on the other region in terms of losses of jobs in one state had a significant negative impact upon job losses elsewhere. And so the, the, the sort of question that we would ask now is what role do the interregional trade linkages play as well as the nature of that trade. In other words, intra versus inter-industry, okay. So the, the uh, issue here is the spatial and temporal scale for modeling economies. Um, how can we embrace this a little bit more effectively? 
in terms of some sort of micro mac macro modeling and perhaps some simulation. And we want to look at uh, a further issue here is the link between international and interregional trade and value added, how closely integrated they are. And uh, uh, we've also been uh, looking at uh, uh, modeling unexpected events like things like recessions, floods, COVID, and Donald Trump. Uh, let me jump over this because I want to um, uh, uh, move on to other stuff and time is moving along. So basically the opportunity is that spatial heterogeneity results in uneven responses. Um, but we need to show that this heterogeneity, if built into macro models, using amongst other sources of information, global value chain analysis, will improve the quality of those macro models. And I think that uh, this is something that uh, would be very, very important to think about some sort of international collaboration on this. And uh, perhaps IIOA could uh, take some sort of leadership here, because I think if we can demonstrate that it makes an important contribution to macro modeling, hopefully we will be able to continue to rock. Um, so what we have de determined from this is it's not a question of all competition. There's also a great deal of complementarity. And, and what is the interesting result of this work is we are seeing that at one and the same time, regions are becoming more complementary. In other words, they're participating in more um, value chains, while also they're competing with each other to get that activity located within their states. Uh, the other aspect of this that makes it important for us to understand is when we're thinking about regional development policy, it's also important for us to consider the impacts of policy that we refer to as spatially blind, that they have the same impact on all regions. And the answer is that they don't. And I want to show two very quick examples um, uh, of, of this. Um, one drawn from uh, work with Eduardo Haddad in Brazil, and the other one is the work uh, that Bart Loos participated in on the impact of uh, Brexit at the NUTS2 nuts level. So Brazil reduced tariffs by 10%, and the expectation is that these would have uh, the same impact on sectors and regions, no matter where they were located. So here's an example of two regions, the Northeast and the Center South, Northeast typically has per capita incomes about 50% of those in the center south. What do we find? All of the sectors in the Northeast have a negative response. In other words, they are producing goods and services that are going to be very, very competitive uh, with uh, now cheaper imports coming into Brazil, whereas the center south, much more integrated and higher value added value chains is going to have a much more positive response. Yeah, a few sectors are going to be negatively affected, but for the most part, it's very positive. So I think this diagram, more than anything else, should demonstrate to macro folks that you need to get inside countries. Uh, what happens is not homogeneous, and we need to understand the dimensions. And then there's a further dimension. What about the links between these two regions? And if we look at this work, we find Another form of asymmetry, the Northeast is very, very dependent upon uh, the rest of Brazil as a source of inputs. But if you look at the rest of Brazil, the purple part of the top that shows a tiny percentage of inputs that come from the Northeast. So we have asymmetry in terms of uh, dependence. And that means that uh, anything that affects the Southeast is going to have a positive effect there, but very little spillover effects uh, on the northeast of the region. And the Brexit one, uh, which we're living through right now, is uh, just a fascinating example because it, it basically shows how heterogeneous uh, the impacts are. And I think one thing that I, I always have noticed from, from this diagram is basically uh, 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 Spain and Portugal are relatively unaffected. Uh, by, by this process. And there is some uh, more recent evidence that perhaps they may be positively effective as a lot of the automobile supply chain uh, operations that were formerly dependent 
in the U UK are now moving over to uh, Spain and Portugal. Did somebody say something? Oh, okay. Um, just let me go through the next few slides rather quickly. Um, linking our work with the new economic geography and fragmentation. Um, one of the things that I, I really have found challenging in, in a lot of the new economic geography is this notion of using iceberg transportation costs. In other words, a certain percentage of a product disappears as we move from region I to region J. In effect, trade is very sensitive to transportation margins. And uh, I think it's very important that GVC analysts is embedded in these multi-economy models. And if you look at uh, some of the work that uh, Eduardo Haddad and colleagues have been doing in Brazil, and you think about the spatial CGE models of the late Johannes Brücke uh, in the European context, it's very, very clear that identifying those transportation margins turns out to be an important source of explanation in terms of the strength and direction uh, of trade. And now we've got a further uh, impact on uh, uh, sort of trade agreements and how that affects them. And so those sort of tariff and trade margins uh, are important. And so highlighting those things within the global value chain analysis would be important. Fragmentation of production is something that has been proposed as somewhat competitive with the new economic geography, but I think it's much more complementary. And basically, uh, the idea is we move from very uh, primitive forms of extraction through initial transformation, uh, increasing the value added, we finally finish the product and we deliver it to market. And what we can show here is the potential for innovation increases as we move from the left to the right, but the bullwhip effect goes in the other direction. In other words, there's much more uh, business cycle fluctuation at the lower part of the, the scene. So here, uh, this very much ties in with um, uh, Lucia's work and Shang Gao, uh, who's working with uh, Kuiyong uh, in uh, uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, is, is to see how the location characteristics of each stage, the degree to which they're stable or to which they are changing. And obviously, this then uh, promotes uh, a, a very strong need to link this work with uh, risk and resilience. And we can think of this as uh, risk as a heightened exposure to unexpected events. You know, how vul vulnerable is the production chain to spatial monopsonistic suppliers, for example. And resilience is the ability of the economy to recover from a, a, a disaster. And right now, there's a great deal of concern that China um, occupies a, a huge percentage of the supply of rare earth oxides and uh, rare earth metals that end up in electronics, weapons, and, and commercial equipment. What happens if China decides not to share those with the rest of the world? So that's something we would want to look at in terms of risk. Uh, resilience we were very um, made very much aware of this at the Fukushima earthquake tsunami in 2011, when Toyota having consolidated its production of the chip that tells the hybrid car to use the battery or the engine was destroyed. Production of hybrid cars ground to a halt for many months. Well, why didn't they go somewhere else and find this chip? The problem is spatial substitution, in other words, finding alternative suppliers is now much more difficult because competitive pressures have resulted in higher levels of capacity utilization and there's little flexibility to increase supply in the short run. So I would like to see us take this enormous valuable data and sort of look at this uh, from the perspective uh, risk and resilience. And uh, in the last year, I think we've become very much more aware of the fragility of some of these uh, production chains. You just look at the pictures in Texas of the last week of what happened uh, when you can get supplies uh, as a result of the uh, problems of the electricity and then the water failures in that state. Supermarkets shelves entirely empty. And so these, these are sort of challenges 
that increased dependence on lengthening supply chains uh, is reducing prices, but it's also exposing us uh, to higher risk. In terms of regional uh, development uh, policy, the opportunities here um, is sort of a litany of uh, uh, proposals that uh, have been uh, identified to help this issue. And the, uh, the last one here is smart specialization. And uh, the opportunity here is sort of builds on this, this notion of uh, the, the simultaneous structural change that is making our regions both complementary and competitive at the same time. Um, have we exploited this? So for example, uh, have we thought about for any particular region, who are our most important trading partners? And with which other regions do we compete? Can we use the GVC analysis to help us understand this? And uh, some work I participated with Joaquim Giliotto and Norihiko Yamano in OECT uh, showed that for some parts of the world, those value chains in a sort of macro sense had remained relatively stable in Europe and in North America, but in East Asia, there were dramatic differences in the uh, spatial sources of supply. We haven't really thought about the role of changes in firm ownership and organization. What is the role of multinational enterprises in the organization of these value chains? What about increasing interregional spillovers? But I think the one area that we have an interesting opportunity uh, for the last few months, I cannot get out of my head, a paper by Andres Rodriguez Pose, who has been talking about uh, this issue and in, he has a paper entitled The Revenge of Places That Don't Matter. And um, what they have shown is, I think very clearly, if you look at what has happened in, in Brazil, the Bre Brexit analysis has revealed that participation in global value chains is not only hom not homogeneous, but has generated very destructive nationalistic trends against further involvement in international trade. And so uh, now I think uh, you recall that earlier diagram from Brazil, I think it's important for us to understand that there are some parts of our countries that are not going to benefit from increases in international trade. And what do we do about it? And what can our working global value chain analysis uh, do to help us in that? The final couple of things I want to, uh, to talk about is some complementarity uh, from the amazing information we have about flows of goods and services to embedding in that uh, analysis of flows of people and especially their embodied human capital. In other words, knowing how many people enter a country or leave a country is valuable, more valuable, is what the, do we know about their, in, in their occupational skills, their educational levels, what we would refer to as their embodied human capital. And we can see lots of examples of this. Um, Scotland, after a period of long population decline, suddenly in the early part of this uh, century, Population increase because a lot of Polish workers immigrated uh, to work in the construction sector. But then when the recession occurred, uh, they returned to Poland because there were no jobs. We have um, problems uh, in the US with the fact that a huge percentage of our agricultural crops, particularly uh, market gardening crops, are harvested by immigrant labor, particularly uh, from, from Mexico. And of course, there's a lot of uh, very strong sentiment that was fueled by Trump uh, that this was bad and it was taking jobs away from Americans, and that was certainly not the case. But it's not just low low wage employment. Uh, I was uh, stunned to find out that in the U.S., one in four medical doctors are not born were not born in in the U.S. and an increasing share of nurses, pharmacists, caregivers especially for the LD population are non-natives. So this trade needs to be explored much more effectively and integrated with that trade in value added. And uh, one aspect of this that has received very little attention is um, uh, rem remuneration back uh, to the home countries. And uh, I found some data that in the US, 
in 2015 sent $56 billion from wages and salaries earned in the U.S. outside the country, $26 billion of which uh, went to uh, Mexico alone. So um, what we, we are thinking here in is uh, how do we address that particular problem. And the final thing I, I want to look at is uh, the problem of income distribution and Asian heterogeneity. And I'm going to go through this uh, pretty quickly. Um, there are two issues here. One is uh, a lot of our models still persist in using a representative household while we disaggregate industry into 500 or more categories. Secondly, wage and salary incomes in a lot of countries are increasingly being augmented by capital income and tracing the source of that is difficult. So how we embrace that in the model is going to be a real challenge. The other aspect that we have to consider is unlike industry, which is mobile, but not infinitely mobile, households are very mobile and thus changes in spatial uh, locations can have enormous changes in where those consumption impacts occur. And finally, the demographic structure is changing rapidly and we need to embrace that. So some of the work that we have done has been to um, uh, augment the, uh, the IO systems by spending much more time disaggregating the sources of income by uh, age, by income, or by skill, or by location, and a complementary disaggregation for the consumption. And if we look at the data, we can see that there are significant changes in the share of income, which is generated by uh, folks of different age groups, with the prime working age group 25 to 44 shrinking. And in Illinois, uh, that age group is going to decline by a third of a million persons between now and 2030, whereas the folks uh, over 65 are going to increase by just under 1 million. And when we look at the analysis, what we find on the right side, you've got a diagram showing the growth rates of uh, consumption by people of different age. The representative household shows about a 10% increase, but the variation is from close to 45% for the uh, for the group 45 to 54, and a decline in the prime working age group 25 to 34 uh, of around 20%. So the question is, does that make any difference? And if we look at these data here, we see that uh, there are some important differences in terms of how people allocate money by age. Similarly, there are differences by income. And uh, I won't spend any time on this. We can, we can show this across uh, major consumption categories uh, by age. And this is a similar uh, picture for uh, consumption categories by income. The differences are not dramatic. But the combination of those small differences in the way people spend their money, plus the differences in the number of people of those different age groups, are going to generate important uh, system-wide effects on our economy. And I think embracing that uh, is going to be important because if people are buying different goods and services as they age, that's going to send signals through our value chains um, and we need to ascertain uh, what does that mean, where are the goods and services going to be sourced and provided. Um, I'm going to jump this. Uh, the Miyazawa stuff is um, mainly known to you, but basically we put it all together. And one of the things we find is enormous heterogeneity in terms of uh, consumption pr propensity. So this is by income on the bottom axis, the lowest 20 percent to the highest 20 percent, their propensity to consume um, is, is incredibly heterogeneous, with the lowest groups uh, generate much higher, if you like, income multipliers than the highest group. When we look at it by age, what we find is that uh, between now, uh, between the early part of this uh, century and 2020, there was an important structural difference with most of the indirect effects accruing to the age groups 45 to 65 with declines in the age groups 16 uh, to, to 44. 
Finally, when we look at the uh, economic impact, this is the multiplier effect, the direct amount of income um, that is generated from a $1 uh, change. But then when it's spent, we get the reverse effect. So here you have very high multipliers for the lowest income groups, smaller multipliers at the higher groups because their propensity to consume is lower. But when that income is spent, who benefits? It's the higher income groups. And basically using this Miyazawa framework, we are able to show how these income distributions are really uh, not deterministic, but have a structure that makes intervention much, much more difficult. And I, I just did a very cursory examination uh, to see how many studies I could find of uh, global value chain analysis that looked at the impact on in income inequality. Not a great deal. Um, and most of that was focused on what I would refer to as the direct effect. In other words, do global value chains change the structure of income? And for example, Gonzalez found that it had a small effect on the low skilled segments and in fact may have reduced inequality. However, it's only looking at the direct income effect. And the Miyazawa analysis enables us to look at the, if you like, the economy-wide impacts of these things. And what, what it happens is that that total effect generates increasing in, in, in income inequality, no matter what happens uh, to the structure of the direct effects. So let's try to bring this all together. Um, I think there is a need to ex extend our general equilibrium perspectives beyond a focus on just trade alone. I think uh, there's some important dynamics to go back again and look at things like flows of funds and uh, to integrate that with flows of people. And this cannot be, I think, very successfully accomplished unless we spend much more time focusing on agent and spatial heterogeneity. And I think that uh, we have with these uh, now um, regional GVC uh, databases an opportunity to exploit this in very, very creative ways. The demographic stuff really is important to look at. As I showed for the Illinois case, most countries in the developed world and surprising places like China are going to find by 2030, as much as 20% of their population are gonna exceed 65 years of age. This is gonna change dependency ratios. What's gonna to happen to labor force participation rates, employment and non-employment? And how will these changes affect consumption patterns and thus change the character and structure of global value chains. So my final uh, plea, if you like, I've been very impressed in the last 10 years that I'm actually reading mainstream economics journals because they are including a number of articles which have interesting empirical analyses, um, addressing things like the heterogeneity of household behavior, uh, location analysis and trade, and some have even included IO data and analysis. So I think there's a real opportunity for IO analysis to move beyond our narrow conception of our work um, and to integrate it much more fully, I think, with mainstream literature and economics planning and other disciplines. And one op opportunity that I haven't mentioned, but I think is an important possibility, is to link global value chain analysis with the emerging interest in the structure and contribution of the so-called circular economy. Why do I want to see this happen? Because I want to see us being able to attract some of the more talented scholars to our field and to increase the stature of input-output analysis and also to connect it with the policy agendas of major national and international organizations. And to do this, I think we've got to be very proactive. And we have to make sure that all elements in our regret matrix, oh my God, I wish we had done this, are zero. And so uh, the challenges and opportunities are many and exciting. Let's not waste them. Thank you very much, Rosa. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. <laughs> for your clever and stimulating presentation, as always. <laughs>
Okay, um, let's start with the discussion. This, this is my first time trying to organize the discussion, so be patient with me. Uh, I think that uh, Jorge will, have, will help me. Um, I course, think that... Course. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think that uh, we have uh, two channels. First, you can raise your hands and we go organize the interventions, but, but also you can write in the chat, okay, both in Spanish or English, as you prefer, and we, we try to translate. It's okay? Perfect. Okay. But I cannot see the hands. <laughs> there are no hands. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> Up to now. Okay. Okay, I, perhaps uh, in the meanwhile, <laughs> I can start <laughs> with my hand. Um, Geoffrey, I think that um, all agree that the, the challenging uh, topic for, for us, for input, for input output analysis is perhaps heterogeneity. You have uh, tell us about this. I think that uh, my, my reflection is that um, the pandemic, the COVID has been, um, in terms of economics, the, the exogenous shock that all of us were expecting. When you say, uh, put an example of an exogenous shock, okay, the pandemic is an exogenous shock and the response has been heterogeneity heterogeneity in space, in space and in different income groups and in different countries and in different... Um, and um, for me, the question is that uh, at the end, as you have um, told in your presentation, um, both the risk and the resilience has to do with this heterogeneity and has to do with the... Um, a structure, the structural change or the structure of the of the economies, and also um, with the capacity to to address a, a a kind of structural change in the in the next year. So, uh, my question or my reflection here uh, would be how to introduce in our models, in our instruments, the this different types of heterogeneity. Okay, um, very broad question, but thank you. Uh, I, I think that uh, there is increasing interest right now in, in understanding the tension between the uh, market forces, which are pushing towards increasing efficiency. So reducing uh, unutilized capacity in the system. And I think that the COVID experience and the more recent experience in Texas has sort of really exposed the fact that efficiency is dominating to such an extent that nobody is paying any attention to resilience. And, and um, uh, ye yesterday at the Western Regional Science meetings, um, Rick Church gave a presentation on how uh, a lot of modeling needs to really reflect on, on uh, this whole issue of risk and, and resilience because our infrastructure systems are much, much more fragile than we mentioned. Not only the global value chain systems, but the infrastructure, for example, electricity networks, uh, water networks, um, our, our uh, transportation systems in, in total. And I think, I think that uh, we have... Uh, not done a very effective job of, of addressing that and usually put it in the last paragraphs of our paper. Uh, there is an opportunity to link this work with uh, notions of it. Well, let's let's not put it there. Let's make that the focus of this. And, and how do we do this? And so if I'm living in a region, um, uh, what, what do I know about uh, the exposure if, if we have another crisis? What do, what do what do I do if we have a, uh, uh, a sort of a event that happened in Texas where the electricity network goes down? Um, how are we going to survive? What does this do? And interestingly, Adam Rose 
who um, is an IIOA member and has done a lot of work on this, has found that business interruption costs, for the most part, are much, much larger than the losses generated by the infrastructure. In other words, that is, if, if uh, you don't have electricity, you can not produce cars, and that's part of the business interruption cost, as opposed to you have a dam uh, that uh, is breached and it causes flooding. That is the sort of the infrastructure part of it. And so what, what this tells us is that we, we've got a very finely tuned economy that is operating relatively efficiency, but now is much more vulnerable to interruptions. And he scared the hell out of us yesterday by saying that there are about 20 uh, major transformer stations in the US that if they were destroyed, would bring the total electric supply system uh, to a halt. And in 2013, uh, some probably very fine guys, according to Trump, uh, actually destroyed one of these stations in California, and it brought the uh, Silicon Valley to a halt because they are not protected, all right? Why? Because the private sector uh, did not think in terms of, of that sort of vulnerability. So these are issues. Who's going to pay for this? How is that? How are those costs going to be charged? Um, these, are, these are issues that we haven't considered. So yes, it's wonderful to go into my store and find that I have 46 varieties of breakfast cereal. Um, but what would happen if, if we had an unexpected value? You know, in other words, uh, and I ended up having a choice of only five. Would my welfare be significantly? In my case, no. But in a lot of people's case, that variety is very important. It's part of their, uh, if, if you like, utility function. But that's a, a kind of facetious example. But I mean, in terms of general operations of our economy, um, these are things that we haven't considered. And we have the database to do this. And it's a matter of thinking creatively about how we, we can exploit it in, in some form of fashion. And I'm, as we have Bart here, I'm just wondering whether you know, you're much uh, more involved in this than, than I have been. Have, have any people thought about this in terms of um, analytical work, Bart? Yeah, well, in, in, in general, I, I, th I think one of the issues is that with the more or less traditional methods that we tend to use, uh, combined with the, with the new sets of data, we can basically uh, describe uh, history and sketch uh, stylized facts. And uh, these stylized, stylized facts are often very welcome. But when it comes to policymaking, uh, I owe uh, analysis in the traditional uh, sense cannot say very much. So you presented our, our work on Brexit and that generated quite some interest. But as soon as people from London School of Economics started to use their uh, advanced methods using uh, input out interregional input output tables, uh, they could say, OK, uh, if tariffs will be that high, then this will be the consequences for Cumbria or for inner you know, London. If, however, uh, tariffs are a little bit lower after Brexit, then the consequences will be such. And these are issues we cannot address um, uh, with uh, traditional input output techniques. So I was going to ask you a question like, OK, if we want to go beyond uh, what we are uh, currently doing and if we want to be taken seriously by mainstream uh, uh, scientists, what do you think should we as young researchers read? And if we are older researchers, what should we teach our younger uh, colleagues or, or our PhD students, for example? Uh, I was about to ask you that question because I also enjoyed the talk by Richard Baldwin, but I think we were rock stars at the time because we constructed data that were not available. And of mm -hmm. course, it's not just Wyatt, it's also Eora and the data co constructed by OECD and Axiobase. So there are several initiatives that uh, contributed to this. But we were the rock stars at the time because we, we constructed the data, but other people are currently the rock stars using our data. And I don't think we made that jump towards contributing ourselves to high level economic analysis. So I yeah. don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I, at least well, my I, feelings. It, it, it confirms my, my impression too. 
that uh, I think it's a, a case that we we generated a potential competitive advantage, but we didn't exploit it, and uh, and others have, and uh, I think it's it's a real opportunity to to invite in um, younger folks and collaborators who come at um, at these sort of analyses from from different parts of the economics or planning discipline and and try to get them involved in in working with this and bringing their different methodologies and different perspectives um, so i think i think there's a danger of of just using uh, off the shelf um, methodology and in, in extending uh, the io analysis into into cge modeling rather than thinking about what aspects of that cge work do we really need to focus on rather than just using something that's readily available and so a good example of that is spending a much much more time on uh, on agent heterogeneity in other words disaggregation of households spending much more time thinking about movements of people migration and so forth in other words creating value added but with the base that we have which is an amazing source of uh, economic information that if I, i've been going back and looking at some of the early work on interregional modeling and i mean it, it it was staggering you know how difficult it was uh, karen polensky's model of the u.s economy used to cost fifty six thousand dollars in computer time uh, to to get a result. Um, now you know somebody can do this on a laptop uh, in a, in a matter of seconds. So we have this analytical capability. But I think I think what your your question is sort of going towards what do, what do we need to do to be creative? And what I offered was a small subset of things that, from my own perspective, I think are, are really important, and they represent challenges that uh, we're facing. And Rodriguez Pose's article, I think, really is something we need we need to think about we, we we basically promote these things as having universal benefits but those benefits are incredibly heterogeneous in some cases they're negative so why don't we try to look at the way in which increasing integration in global value chains what has this done to the spatial structure of opportunity uh, inside countries and if you look at uh, the recent voting patterns in the UK, when Johnson was elected prime minister, he got the greatest support from the places that you guys identified as having uh, the most negative impacts um, from from Brexit. So I, I think these are sort of challenges that we need to embrace. But for a young person, you have to be somewhat risk averse. I mean, you don't want to do something which is uh, highly speculative. But this is something I think where uh, hopefully some of the leaders in our field can be a little bit more proactive in, in engaging with, with other um, uh, ideas. And uh, when I get the students from economics, I tell them, you've got to retain your, your label as a macroeconomist or as a labor economist. And uh, the IO stuff has got to be embedded in that rather than saying, you know, I'm, I'm an IO specialist. Uh, and so forth. So. Okay, we have two other hands, Alejandro first and Jose Manuel second. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Miss President, thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Jeff. Nice to see hey, you. To hear nice you. To see you. Thank you for taking time away from being a politician. It's a pleasure. <laughs> it's a pleasure to go out from from San Telmo Palace. So. Trust me. Okay, so it's, it's a very general question that we have had in some of our seminars, and I would like to know your opinion. We are doing, uh, most of us, most of us are doing several IO or CE or SAMS uh, models trying to capture the COVID, the COVID, uh, the COVID impact in the at different levels, sector, economy in general, etc. So uh, my concern is not, I am not so sure that our imputable table, the, the, the database that we use, can capture uh, the real effect because my impression is that everything is changing, changing quickly. And I don't know if the connection, if the interrelation between the different accounts are will recognize. Uh, tell me that 
uh, give me to use this this expression can recognize the real economy right now because everything is crazy so uh, of course in some year we are in 2021 in, 20, in 2025 we are going to have a new input output uh, table in general in the different region and national levels but we are using the the last input output table for for the last two or three years or the last version of 2020 so i'm not so sure that we're using a good database because this crisis is very 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 uh, strange and i'm not so sure that the relation can be captured in well way so what is your opinion about it okay uh, thank, thank you. you yeah i yeah, we we have modeled COVID using sort of standard epidemiological models to try to capture the um, the progress of of the disease, but that has not been linked with economic models. And where we have done this, uh, we have found uh, the U.S. Census Bureau, for example, has been bringing out very high frequency data on changes in consumption, and uh, we've seen dramatic shifts in the way in which people have been spending money. So decreases on restaurants, decreases on transportation, uh, decreases on going out to the cinema and so on and so forth, and a massive increase in um, expenditures on food. So we, we can take that sort of information and put that into the model. And then uh, uh, what is missing is the degree uh, to which the uh, activities in the economy can respond to those short run increases. So for example, um, in, in March last year, uh, you could go into a US supermarket and you would not find any rolls of paper towel or any toilet paper, okay? And the question is, why? And it turned out that some of these production chains are so specific to certain types of products so that toilet paper produced uh, for the airlines is not perfectly substitutable with toilet paper used at home. So the ability of, of uh, those production systems to change. And I think what we can do, we can, we can do some simulation of that. Um, because I think it's very uh, unreasonable to expect us to get real-time data for a lot of this. But I think we can do a lot of things which are very helpful. And, and to get people to understand uh, the sort of flow on effects from from those changes in consumption patterns. Well, what is it? You know, if I spend a hundred dollars uh, this month and I spend a hundred dollars last month, why does it have a different impact on the economy? Because the composition of that expending, and I think that was something that our policymakers uh, were very interested in finding out. So, at a time when employment levels were declining, uh, organizations uh, like Amazon, uh, uh, were increasing their employment, people to drive vans to deliver um, goods and services. So this, that sort of structural change, I think we can handle. Um, but the sort of production changes that you're talking about, the degree to which they are short term or long term, that's going to be much more difficult. But I think we can do that perhaps with some sort of simulation. Uh, yeah, uh, Congratulations uh, on your football team. Uh, yeah, yeah, ranking third, yes. And I head to the final of the King's Cup, hopefully. Uh, uh, congratulations for your victory last Saturday with Preston. And, and yesterday. Oh, yesterday, okay, good. Okay, uh, well, thank you, thank you, Jeff, for the presentation. Uh, it's always very motivating, uh, not for young researchers, but also for older researchers with uh, grey hair like me. I mean, uh, <laughs> some of you remember me without grey hair, I mean, uh, many years ago. So uh, I would like to react uh, to some of uh, your uh, I mean, statements in the presentations and, and also from the people. Uh, I mean, I, I've, uh, in relation to uh, m more a uh, more defining macro models from aggregated multi-regional models. I have experienced this. I mean, uh, on life. I mean, last year, uh, in the European Commission, they uh, use a um, let's say macro focus model, Quest. I don't know if you, any of you know them. Uh, and it, it was quite shocking to know that uh, they uh, were modeling EU as a whole with the. Uh, the four big four countries and 
and, and nothing else. I mean, one economy sector, etc. Uh, then I understood, okay, that, that's fine. I mean, it's just forecasting GDP as a whole, etc. But then I thought, I mean, I fully agree. I mean, uh, I managed to do some input output work with the OECD tables and try to decompose uh, the effects that they, they were forecasting uh, at the sector level and uh, at the country level. Uh, and that was, you know, in the end, it was cited in this uh, spring economic forecast that the Commission publishes. So it, it's a first step. And I think that, uh, for example, uh, basic input output, which is true that it can only give you a, a picture of what was in the past and how with changes in demand will, I mean, in a short run can change things uh, using the same structure. But it's true that the, uh, in terms of policy analysis, that's OK. That only serves for the first paragraph of the report of the policy, you know, uh, policy analysis. Uh, what's the state of the art and, 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 and how things are related. But then really the policy impact is not, I mean, input output is very limited. So I think that, I mean, uh, models like, uh, uh, I, I hope Uncle Kurt is listening to this, uh, Fidelio, I mean, econometric yeah. input output models mm -hmm. that overcome the limitations of input output, basic input output. Uh, I mean, Cambridge econometrics, etc. I mean, they, these models, which are based in input output, they, they, they could be used for these purposes. And moreover, I mean, why don't you put the wired tables inside the, the, this type of models or Figaro or uh, OECD? I mean, this has never been done before. I mean, it, we always rely on the Armington assumptions, etc. But just put it inside the model, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and see what happens. I mean, at least this is our idea of, of going beyond that. And then instead of of, of putting, I mean, the, the multi-country input output tables, then do the multipliers, the typical stuff, then you put that into a wider framework where you don't have such an input output limitations, and then you can model trade margins, tax and subsidies products, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff. So, um, I, I cannot. I mean, I fully agree with you. It, it, this could be a way to pursue. Uh, there is another way. I mean, uh, the the UN or the, the Global Value Chain Satellite Account. I don't know if you've heard of a UN handbook, well, UN guidelines, better said, on, on the GVC satellite accounts. I mean, uh, this is uh, done from a statistical point of view, and well, what it it. What it does is to combine, uh, you, know, you take a value chain uh, of an automobile industry, identify the main products, the main suppliers, the main countries, etc., business functions. I mean, it's, an, it's another story, but they put it into an input output framework so that you can do input output analysis and, and evaluate how much is the employment or emissions or value are embedded in the value chains or indirect uh, spillovers, etc. I, I think this could be a, an avenue. To, to to also to to maintain as you say to, to keep IO as a good instrument for the, for the future and uh, regarding the covid um, what what I mean a way to link the epidemiological models with the economic what we thought I mean we are currently doing some stuff on this I mean at some point we had the number of days, within a quarter that uh, we had restrictions. So then that is a measure of how much, you know, you affect the demand of that good because it was closed down, et cetera. And then you can sort of, uh, you know, uh, it's a soft link, but uh, to see what happens. I mean, if you, I mean, if you use this indicator, I mean, just an, an idea I would like to share with you because I think that most of us are trying to do the same the same thing i mean try to evaluate impacts of, of covid with with io tables uh, and, and and then yeah one maybe i um, uh, don't know i mean it's not a very uh, let's say uh, positive message but i mean uh, who will believe the tables of 2020 who will i mean we, we will believe those that the eurostat statistical offices will publish but uh, well okay uh, don't compare it too much with 19 uh, or, or I don't know or the next 25 I think Alejandro was right 
I mean, we'll see what we will get for the tables of 2020. I think in EU, for most of the countries, if not all, they will compile both, 19 and 20, because in, internally they, they, they need to compare, I mean, the difference with the, the pre-COVID and post-COVID uh, issues. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, they uh, mentioned to circular economy. This is great because, uh, I mean, uh, it's something that we, uh, I, I mean, this is uh, linking global value chains with, with circular economy. Uh, we are pushing forward to this also, as, as well, uh, with the EU Green Deal and all the, the policy issues. Okay, I mean, I, I, I don't have a specific question. I mean, it was just, just to share with you because I don't see you quite often. I mean, <laughs> many of, okay. the, of the things that come to my mind from uh, Bart's words, Alejandro, and, and your words. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jose Manuel. I, I just make a couple of quick comments. Um, we have maintained for 30 years an econometric input output model, and uh, I think it's one of those forms that over the next four or five years, I hope we can engage more people to think about, particularly uh, integrating in a sort of CGE type framework. And uh, I, there's an increasing uh, interest now in econometric estimation of the parameter spaces in um, uh, CG type models. And, and I think it makes a lot of sense to think collaboratively about how we can take advantage of both of those things. And you mentioned some of the work that uh, um, uh, Kurt Kartena has, has been doing on this, particularly with reference to the household sector and i think that um that that uh, to my way of thinking is is something that's important you know the household stuff in the u.s is around 70 percent of gross product uh i think it's around 60 percent in in spain and it's it's scandalous to me that we spend so little time worrying about that structure because that is changing much more rapidly the question is whether it's it's going to remain that way and the final comment uh I just saw a report from University of Chicago that estimates that number of percentage of days where people would work from home uh, was around 5% in 2017. In this year, they're estimating it's going to be 20%. What's that going to do to demand for public transportation? Um, are people going to relocate their houses so you have a sort of a housing market impact? And during this crisis, our uh, housing prices and housing sales have been increasing month by month by month. So, I mean, th there are all sorts of very interesting dynamics, but I agree with you. I'd like to see much more focus on, on some sort of economic, econometric integration uh, with, with the IO systems and, um, and finding creative ways to embed them would be something very, really fascinating. So perhaps Eric has got a couple of students in Groningen uh, along with Bart that uh, could could start this process. Okay, also, yeah, you could... <laughs> okay sorry, Kurt, Katrina? <laughs> Is there? Yeah, thank you. Ah, okay. <laughs> thank you. As I have been addressed several times, I take the opportunity. So, first of all, I'm happy to hear that uh, Fidelio uh, is uh, used uh, for this kind of analysis. I would just make a very short remark and, and just compliment a bit this aspect of heterogeneity that uh, Jeff was mentioning and that we were discussing. I think there is one uh, also in, in uh, connection with the COVID crisis and the recession and economic policy to get out of that. There is one aspect I think where we where the uh, IO community has not done so much and which was an important uh, macroeconomic debate of the last, let's say, uh, at least 10 years since the financial crisis, which is uh, what I would call multiply heterogeneity. There has been a lot of discussion how large is the fiscal multiplier and multiplier analysis is the core of our business, so to say, and uh, we have not contributed too much to that. And the issues that Jeff was mentioning, like income distribution, now this heterogeneity of 
um, uh, uh, propensities of consumption across different household groups and so on and so forth. All these things contribute to this multiply heterogeneity and this will be a hot issue still uh, for the next at least five years, to, so to see, because we have the, in, in Europe at least, we have this next generation uh, package of economic policy measures to get out of the crisis, and we will have a lot of um, demand of analyzing the impact of these things. So this is something I just wanted to, to add to the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kurt. Um, my comment on that would be um, that the the sort of interesting dilemma, uh, if if high income people um, don't spend money, they don't generate job possibilities for lower income people. But then when lower income people uh, have those job opportunities and they spend money, most of that impact ends up in higher income people worsening uh, the income inequality. And the second issue is, is how do we deal with increasing shares of non-wage and salary income? And where do we we put those aspects in our account. In the social accounting matrix, it's there, um, but the sources uh, of that income generation that don't come from wage and salaries is much, much more complicated, much more diffused, and we're going to have to think uh, creatively about those. But thank you very much. I agree with your, your comments and sentiments. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps a, a last question. There is one question in the chat, Rosa, okay. but I think that maybe the question has already been widely answered because of the previous interventions. Uh, it's about uh, what kind of considerations we have to take into account when trying to make uh, models or using multisectoral models to, to try to inference uh, such events like the COVID-19. So maybe with the previous <laughs> yeah. comments, uh, we have widely answered this this, top, this question. Sorry. Okay. So any other question? Perhaps from people below 40, young people <laughs> in the chat or? <laughs> I don't see anybody. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, please. I'm, thir I'm 39. Uh, so <laughs> I just, just, In your dreams, baby. Uh, <laughs> uh, shut up. Um, so um, I, I very much agree with what you said about um, heterogeneity, but at the same time, um, there's also um, there's also a price to pay, in the sense that um, okay. If we go from a national model to a regional model, then the next step is that people will say, well, let's go for municipalities. And after that, we have these people. And I know that in Chicago, there are a couple of people who, do, who look at, at neighborhoods even. Um, and the question is, first of all, what do we gain from that? But at the same time, uh, what is the price to pay? Because these uh, data do not exist. Um, you have to estimate them, and um, yeah, I think I think one of the aspects in in this work is to look carefully at um, the robustness of the outcomes and try to um, uh, well get a balance of um, the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. There is a a point beyond which a model's credibility starts to deteriorate very dramatically. But in, in a case where you have important decision-making units, for example, in the U.S. states, uh, with ha which have uh, fiscal powers, I think it makes a lot of uh, sense. Neighborhoods, I, 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 I think I cannot imagine trying to do that. But there may be some way we can generate some more aggregated information and have a sort of micro macro link, but trying to develop a multi-regional model of, of neighborhoods. Um, well, I think, I think unless we, somebody wants to do it, but I, I don't think it's going to be very valuable. No, but I think one of the important issues here is um, um, let, let the question uh, determine the level uh, right. of what you're, what you're, the level at which you uh, are analyzing things. Right. Yeah. And for some analyses, it, it does make sense 
uh, to go down, let's say, even at municipality level. Uh, yeah. But for other analyses, it, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. So. Okay. So, Jorge, any other question in the chat or something? No, no? there's only one interesting comment about the new Cardiff's manager. Uh, somebody is suggesting that maybe <laughs> Jeff is <laughs> okay. suggested the name, but now no more. <laughs> okay, we can open. Yeah, I think Jeff got the phone and used his extensive after, experience that she was a perfect manager. After Sam, really we job. can open another session on football. <laughs> yes. Something like that. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Jeff, again, for your presentation. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, sharing your thoughts here. And I would like to remember that the call for seminars is open. I think it's a good opportunity. You know that it is an informal, um, <laughs> an informal community. It's a, but I think it's an interesting way to share our progress and to discuss with colleagues uh, uh, our work and our interests. So I encourage you to to send your your work and i think that the call is open no yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes Still March. okay and um, okay um perhaps next next month we will have the um, the next seminar you will receive the information and and okay we close our session here and have a a nice day and a yeah. nice month. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you all for spending the late afternoon here. Now go out and enjoy a glass of wine. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye,